guys know about it during uh, october 2nd uh, on the occasion of uh, uh, gandhi jayanti's birth uh, gandhi's birth anniversary prime minister has uh, uh, basically inaugurated a summit called vibhav summit where indian researchers can interact with the nri's uh, researchers working across many different areas so that they can exchange ideas to come up with uh, uh, solutions to all those problem so sikri uh, was one of the champion institutes in energy and myself and one more colleague of mine we both were involved in uh, uh, you know discussing about energy crisis uh, when i talk about energy crisis even now lot many people in india do not know what this is all about so we need to create basically energy transparency and lot many people do not know what uh, you know we need to eradicate this energy illiteracy okay how do we communicate this we need to come up with a balance sheet uh, rather initially you say what are the resources available and what is our expenditure as of now and how do you uh, overcome the balance okay so that's that's uh, uh, related to energy <clears throat> and uh, the other one being of course healthcare uh, i would touch upon maybe during the course of my lecture but the point i wanted to highlight here is the solutions to all these problems are viable only through effective research and through science and technology and that's why you know many of the people are involved in doing research uh, to find out solution to these global issues so the moment i talk about doing research i don't know uh, you uh, guys would uh, you know uh, feel the pressure uh, you know you you do see itself has come up with uh, uh, ideas that uh, faculty should be involved in doing research how do you do research you know um, so in this aspects <clears throat> today i will be highlighting one of the unique technique one of the unique technique in the area of research by using this technique one can able to visualize an atom one can able to see an atom one can able to feel an atom you know which many other techniques uh, in fact i can go one step ahead say that no other techniques would provide information at atomic level precisely when compared to technique like scanning probe microscopy so what i will do today is i'll try to introduce what are these techniques okay and among the scanning probe technique the most popular techniques are scanning channeling microscope and atomic force micro microscope so we will uh, uh, we will go on and look at what are the principles behind it maybe some instrumentation and some of the applications apart from this uh, i will also highlight uh, uh, about xps okay <clears throat> now uh, the nanotechnology as a whole has been revolutionized by the famous lecture given by richard fenman in the year 1959 at california institute of technology in fact the title of lecture is there is plenty of room at the bottom that's the title of lecture you know uh, in fact richard fenman uh, uh, richard feynman some people pronounce richard fenman is basically uh, a psychologist come mathematician okay he was basically a psychologist come mathematician and he gave a famous lecture stating many uh, you know intriguing sentences stating many intriguing uh, uh, concepts during that lecture titled as there is plenty of room at the bottom he made sentences like this <clears throat> consider the possibility that we too can make a thing very small which does what we want that we can manufacture objects at that level okay i will i will elaborate these points during the course of my lecture and he made such a statement like uh, one can write all the 25000 pages of 1959 edition of encyclopedia britannica in the area uh, uh, in the area relevant to the size of a pin head you can imagine right kundus your head just a pin head and under that area he made a statement that one can write 25000 pages of uh, uh, encyclopedia britannica which is a you know completely a misleading statement in the year 1959 and he also made many statement like chemistry would become a matter of literally placing atoms one by one in a manner exactly the way we want to arrange okay and uh, so he predicted 
uh, using big tools to make smaller tools suitable for making yet smaller tools and so on until researchers find a tool of right size that they can directly manipulate atoms and molecules so in a in a short what he made a statement was researchers would come up with a uh, you know instrument or equipment thereby one can look at a smallest size of an object you know so to understand this concept <clears throat> let me uh, let me just you know uh, again tell a small story then we will come back to this you know what's the uh, small size of object our human eye can resolve can uh, if you have any answer you can tell me if you uh, what's the small size of an object where a naked eye can resolve any idea how low our eye can visualize an object any any guess i know you guys may be busy <laughs> but okay Point uh, point two millimeter. Point two millimeter. Okay, very yes. close, very close. Yes. How? Or point one millimeter. Yes, yes, yes. Precisely. Let's say our uh, human hair is roughly about seventy-five to hundred micron. Point one, point two millimeter is roughly about hundred, two hundred microns, right? Yes. With that, uh, we can visualize with our human eye. <clears throat> let's assume, uh, for example, let's say at a certain distance. you want to look at a person okay assume that uh, we are roughly about uh, let's say about half a kilometer to 1 kilometer hope we can see the person whom he is coming right assume that person is our friend suppose you want to know who is that person can our human eye can tell maybe in a distance of about half a kilometer to 1 kilometer can our human eye can tell who is that person assume that he or she is our friend chalala ma sir yes can we say right yeah uh let's assume probably we can able to make out like who is the person now uh if i ask a question like what is the color of the pen he or she carries definitely it would be not possible with our human eye to tell at that distance correct now if i give you uh, let's say a 64 64 megapixel probably is the latest one we have maybe let's say uh, 120 120 uh, yeah. mai kisi guru guru ko bol raha hu hello yeah uh, let's say if i give you a very high resolution uh, megapixel mobile phone can we zoom 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 in and then tell who is the i mean what's the color of the pen here okay so again uh, it may be very difficult to uh, resolve with that distance and you know, a lot of hand house case kya ho gaya aapko normal very good very good probably fathers can mute it would be good for me <laughs> otherwise i would also listen the same thing okay uh, right uh so with with that distance probably we can uh, it won't be possible for us to resolve that much closely so what is uh, the factor which uh, limits its resolution that was proposed by a person called abe and the law is called abe's law of resolution limit <clears throat> what do i mean by that the source of the wavelength of light we use to visualize an object limits its resolution i repeat again the source of the wavelength of the light we use to visualize an object limits its resolution basically our human eye uses a uh, uh, visible range of spectrum which is roughly about 400 to 800 nanometer okay so that wavelength range limits the resolution of an object and that's why we come up with many uh, other microscopes like uh, 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 scanning electron microscope transmission electron microscope scanning channeling microscope afm etc these are all polarizing uh, microscope okay now uh, so that's where instead of moving from a light as a source to visualize an object people changed uh, to x rays and they used the electron beam as a source to visualize an object <clears throat> if you look at the history behind the scanning probe microscope discovery the very first light microscope meaning optical microscope was discovered uh, in the year 19, uh, 1600 
and the transmission electron microscope came up in the year 1938 then scanning electron uh, microscope in the year 1964 and the very first scanning tunneling microscope remember among all this technique only stm alone can give you an atomic level resolution okay uh, so this is the kind of principle through which the scanning probe microscopy works in this technique what do we do is we would uh, use a probe okay we would use a probe which is nothing but an atomically sharp tip i will i will highlight this point a bit later right now you assume that we would use a probe to image the sample substrate and the probe is an atomically sharp tip so when you bring the probe as close as possible to the sample substrate due to overlap of electron density from the sample or atom present on the sample to the atom present on the tip the overlap of electron density of state lead to what is called a tunneling current so you can measure the tunneling current over the xy plane of the sample substrate thereby one can image the atoms or molecular arrangement on the sample substrate and that's why this technique has become very very powerful <coughs> in fact uh, the scanning channeling microscope was discovered in the year 1982 the first paper which came up uh, uh, in in a, in a journal called applied physics letter in 1982 and these are the two persons they discovered stm one is gerard binick he was a, a phd student with hendrik roger okay he is gerard binick and hendrik roger for this discovery Uh, they received the nobel prize in physics in the year 1986 in fact they shared the prize with uh, another uh, great nobel laureate called ernst rushka for the discovery of scanning channeling uh, sorry scanning electron microscope okay so the nobel prize in physics for the year 1986 uh, was shared among these three people these two were involved in stm and this person is involved in the discovery of uh, uh, scanning electron microscope in fact i used to tell a story uh, to my students uh, when i give lecture you know uh, when the nobel prize was announced in 1986 uh, immediately the media person went to interview these two people he is gerard benick and he is henry groger okay uh, but these two uh, uh, refused to give a interview immediately because they were from a uh, ibm uh, zurich laboratory Uh, they committed already to a football match against uh, dow chemicals in germany okay so they do not had sufficient person to represent their team for football so they said that basically they can give the interview only after completing the match in fact uh, there was a book which deals about this story very well at the end of the book they have this photograph okay uh, in fact uh, ibm zurich last this football match 4-2 to dow chemicals though they last all look happy because uh, these two received nobel prize uh, in the area of physics in 1986 <clears throat> okay now if you look at the scanning probe microscopy there are many techniques that evolved instead of measuring quantum tunneling of electron between the probe and the sample substrate one can measure the atomic force exist between the probe and the sample substrate then that technique is called atomic force microscopy i will i will elaborate the basic principle a bit later right now uh, we can look at what are the different techniques available under the scanning probe technique okay and instead of atomic force if you measure magnetic force that technique is called magnetic force microscopy and one can measure you know not just force you can measure ionic conductance capacitance chemical potential difference etc so depends upon the parameter you measure the scanning technique uh, would be different okay <clears throat> now as far as stm is concerned meaning scanning channeling microscopy is concerned i mentioned that uh, the basic principle behind the imaging atomic uh, images using this technique is quantum tunneling of electron what do i mean by this quantum tunneling of electron when you bring a, a, an atomically sharp tip <clears throat> as close as possible to the sample substrate okay the moment you reach a very uh, uh, 
close level of uh, distance of separation let's say within an order of nanometer level there would be an overlap of electron density of state from a single atom present at the probe to the single atom present at the sample substrate so this overlap of electron density of state would lead to what is called quantum tunneling current and the moment you measured that current at that distance you can move the probe across the xy plane and the sample substrate so that depends upon the arrangement of molecules or atoms and the sample substrate the tunneling current would vary and one can image the change in tunneling current with respect to the movement that that's the basic principle behind the uh, uh, you know imaging using stm <clears throat> why uh, the tunneling current is important is because this is the relation when you uh, come closer and closer the tunneling current would vary exponentially with respect to distance of separation between the probe and the sample substrate in fact if you vary the distance by 1 armstrong which is 0.1 nanometer okay if you vary the distance by 1 armstrong there would be a change of at least an order of magnitude in the tunneling current and that's why uh, this this becomes very very useful technique <clears throat> okay uh the uh, by the way in this equation k is nothing but a work function since the basic principle involves quantum tunneling of electron we can only use conducting substrate to image using stm in fact that is also one of the drawback of the stm okay to overcome this drawback only other scanning probe techniques evolved like atomic force microscopy or magnetic force microscopy etc <clears throat> okay now uh so since it involves only the conducting substrate uh, the work function plays a major role that is reflected in the uh, value of uh, k okay that's the tunneling barrier <clears throat> now what do i mean by quantum tunneling of electrons uh, probably you guys should have heard about uh, you know classical uh, theory based definition for example probably in, uh, maybe in school sir undergrad we would have studied about this for a chemical reaction to undergo a reactant has to cross an energy barrier okay the re reactant has to cross an energy barrier to undergo a chemical reaction to give you the product you can reduce the activation energy by using uh, you know catalyst temperature pressure etc so classically tunneling of electrons through the barrier is not allowed but according to quantum mechanics the electron can tunnel through the barrier and undergo chemical reaction to give you a product what do i mean by quantum uh, mechanics tunneling of electron the probability of finding spin of electron from the reactant in the product side is half that's the uh, basic definition behind all this quantum mechanical principle okay when i say tunneling of electrons is allowed probability of finding spin of electron from the reactant in the product side is half so so that the electron can tunnel through the barrier it doesn't have to cross the uh, energy barrier always okay <clears throat> so uh, this is what i was trying to explain as a basic principle for scanning channeling microscopy uh, when you bring an atomically sharp tip as close as possible to the sample substrate literally there would be an overlap of electron density of state from a single atom from the tip to the single atom and the sample substrate this overlap of electron density leads to what is called a, a quantum tunneling current okay uh, maybe uh, this may be the very fundamental slide but just i would like to highlight a single point then we will move on okay suppose you have a sample and the probe or a tip since both are conducting substrates we do have a fixed energy level okay so when you bring uh, these two uh, sample and the probe as close as possible there would be a there would be a tunneling barrier and that barrier is expressed as work function in terms of uh, energy okay and uh, when you want to uh, when you want to measure tunneling current between these two the energy barrier so the wave function from the metal uh, need to penetrate through this barrier so that the overlap of electron density could be realized that's the 
uh, idea behind showing this slide. <clears throat> and uh, maybe I will skip this, except saying that one can derive equation for such theory of tunneling. Okay, one can derive equations uh, uh, using Schrodinger equation. Probably you guys would uh, would have heard about it. One can apply a wave function for an electron and derive Schrodinger relation for getting uh, the theory of tunneling. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the STM can operate through two different modes. First one is a constant current mode and the other one is constant height mode. These are the two different modes of operation for STM. What do I mean by constant current mode? Uh, you can keep the tunneling current between the probe and the sample substrate constant. Okay. So the moment you reach the tunneling uh, uh, regime, you can move this tip across the XY plane. So when you move this, depending upon the arrangement of atoms or molecule on the sample substrate, the tunneling current would vary. So one can image uh, that current variation with respect to movement. In the case of constant current mode, <clears throat> we need to use a feedback loop to tell the tip that this is the tunneling current it has to maintain. So in order to maintain this tunneling current constant, the tip will adjust its height, depends upon the arrangement. So one can keep track of the height changes and correlate with the atomic arrangement. So what do I mean by feedback loop? It's like this, okay. Assume that you guys drive a car, <clears throat> okay. There are two different kinds of feedback loop. One could be a positive and the other one could be a negative one. For example, uh, uh, suppose you drive a car, uh, so when you drive, when you are driving, suddenly some person comes in between, what do we do? We simply apply a brake, right? <clears throat> so when we apply a brake, our brain tells you that there is a person, uh, you know, crossing across the road. So you need to apply a brake. This is a negative feedback loop. On the other hand, uh, let's say there are no vehicles on the road and you are driving about 40 kilometers per hour then automatically your brain would say that, you know, since uh, uh, no person in the road, you can basically accelerate your speed, right? So that's the kind of positive feedback loop. Similarly, you need to provide a feedback to the tip saying that this is the tunneling constant current you have to maintain when you, when you move across the sample substrate. So uh, in order to maintain the current constant, the tip will adjust its height. So that's the <clears throat> constant current mode. In the other case where it is constant height mode, you need to maintain the separation. You need to maintain the distance of separation between the probe and the sample substrate constant so that when you move the tip across uh, uh, the sample substrate, the tunneling current would vary. You can measure the tunneling current with respect to uh, uh, arrangement of molecules or atoms on the sample substrate. So these are uh, the two different modes of operation through which an STM can operate. Now, among these two modes of operation, constant height image is the most preferred mode of operation and it would provide an atomically high resolution images. Okay, so among these two, constant height mode of operation would provide anatomically sharp uh, uh, images. <clears throat> now, I mean, you can use this constant height provided you know uh, the surface roughness uh, of the sample substrate. I will, I will talk about it in a while now. <clears throat> now, uh, if you look at the instrumentation behind the scanning channeling microscope, okay, uh, the uh, basic uh, uh, unit, what we will have is a scanning unit okay where it has a sample substrate a probe so when i say you move the tip as close as possible to the sample substrate how do you uh, bring in such movement okay we cannot use our naked eye to move within a, a, a separation of nanometer level separation there are different ways by which one can move the sample tip uh, one can use what is called the inchworm motor and one can use what is called a tripod scanner etc Otherwise, uh, the easy mode of operation would be using a piezoelectric tube. <clears throat> Probably you guys would know what uh, piezoelectric materials are, like, uh, uh, you know, lead zirconate, BBSR03, yttrium zirconate, etc. 
what uh, what is the speciality of these materials the the moment you apply an voltage the piece electric material can shrink or expand depending upon the polarity of the voltage now if you apply the tip uh, or if you connect the probe along with this piece electric tube piece electric tube has four different quadrants so you can apply uh, let's say on the two quadrant a positive voltage which means the tube can shrink then the probe can move uh, you know then the probe can move forward you can control the movement precisely in the order of nanometer by using such uh, uh, voltage when you reverse the polarity when you apply a negative potential let's assume the piezoelectric tube expands then the probe can be retracted back then the probe can be moved back that's the advantage of uh, uh, using piezoelectric material so that one can control the movement of uh, probe towards the sample substrate now <clears throat> so the whole scanning unit uh, uh, need to be hanged normally if you probably i will, I will have a, uh, yeah so i will have an stm image where uh, you can see that this is the whole arrangement of uh, uh, the scanning channeling microscope and this is a, a scanning unit where the probe is uh, attached to a piece electric tube and one can uh, uh, also use the sample substrate okay now uh, this is a modern instrument where everything comes in uh, compact but in the beginning what people did was they used to use a big box and the scanning unit would be hanged within the box why we need to uh, use such kind of arrangement is because we need to avoid uh, vibrations you know because that will introduce what is called the eddy current you know how do we understand this vibration uh, probably you guys should have uh, uh, felt this sami kumudra palaka irna when you oodupathi ethna theriyum like uh, if someone tries to handle that uh, uh, or uh, uh, not necessarily oodupathi you know you can also use the pen for example you cannot hold the pen as such it would uh, vibrate on its uh, uh, own frequency and when i hold such pen the pen basically vibrates uh, the frequency at which i vibrates i vibrate so that is called uh, uh, resonance frequency okay so you need to dampen such uh, uh, frequency that's why the scanning unit has been hanged uh, within the stm cell range <clears throat> okay now uh, of course uh, one can obtain a very beautiful atomic uh, atomic resolution images using stm one can understand the surface defects uh, like surface kinks surface corrugation roughness factor porosity etc by analyzing uh, uh, with this stm now imagine we are talking in terms of uh, atomic level arrangement which our human eye cannot resolve and that's why we use electron as a probe to measure uh, our uh, electron as a probe to understand the atomic arrangement i will i'll talk about this structure a bit later this is called a famous quantum coral structure okay and you can have a molecule uh, like probably uh, i don't know whether you guys know about it there is something called a molecular switch you can also able to make the molecule walk over a, another molecule so such kind of molecular rotators one can carry out with this stm images now <clears throat> i mentioned uh, that one can use an atomically sharp tip as a probe in stm measurement what are the metals or materials one can use we can use what is called tungsten gold or alloys like platinum rhodium platinum iridium etc okay so how do we prepare such atomically sharp tip there are uh, two methods through which one can prepare the first one is simply a metal sniffing of wire you know what do you what do i mean by metal sniffing of wire you can cut uh, you can cut the metal wire at an angle so that you can get an atomically sharp tip <clears throat> the other way to prepare such atomically sharp tip is we can use what is called electrochemical etching you can simply dip a platinum wire into uh, you know alkaline solution like kvh or any wash and when you apply a very high voltage about uh, let's say uh, using a diamond stat you can apply a voltage about 200 or 250 volt 
then at the electrode electrolyte interface rather solid liquid interface there would be a bubble formation the metal undergoes etching the metal would undergo dissolution so that uh, uh, within a fraction of minute or two you would get an atomically sharp tick this will break into two pieces the one would slightly uh, be standing above the solution the other one would be inside the solution in fact both could be used as an atomically sharp tip to image in stm <clears throat> okay so this is the kind of mode of operation now uh, i mentioned earlier that uh, quantum tunneling of electrons between the probe and the sample substrate uh, is a tool uh, to be used in stm imaging now since this involves tunneling of electrons only conducting substrate could be used to image the sample substrate so if you do not have conducting substrate one can carry out sample preparation methods like uh, uh, one can uh, do a sputtering you can give a conductive coating on top of the surface or one can even anneal the sample substrate etc okay <clears throat> okay uh, the point to be remembered here is stm do not probe the nuclear position directly rather it it probes only the electron density and hence the stm images do not always show the position of atoms it only talks about the arrangement of atoms okay and of course it depends on the nature of the surface and magnitude of the tunneling current etc suppose if you look at these two images when you apply a negative potential to the sample substrate to indi uh, to induce this tunneling current let's assume the occupied states you know recall the energy levels i uh, talked about on the sample substrate so if there are electrons present in the energy level the occupied states would generate a tunneling current and uh, that will appear as a bright spot and the unoccupied site will give a dark spot in the images now if you reverse the polarity okay if you reverse the polarity uh, the reverse imaging would happen meaning the unoccupied site would give a bright images and the occupied site would become a dark images okay so uh, i mean uh, uh, just think about it we are uh, discussing about looking at an atom at atomically Uh, sharp images you know of the order of armstrong of the order of fraction of nanometer etc so uh, you could easily be misled by uh, how do i put it you can easily be misled by false images okay it can provide lot of artifacts so how do we basically understand whether the images you record is a real representation of an atom or atomic arrangement or it is simply an artifact so you need to uh, work on that aspect you need to basically scale up and the structural for example if you scan initially uh, let's say 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer if you double the area of scan the structural features should also be doubled okay instead of getting a double structural features if you get triple or four times then that suggests it is an artifact and it is not a real representation of your sample substrate okay so by altering the voltage one can even get a completely a different set of image but we need to understand how uh, the tunneling current works now uh, if you look at the applications point of view okay of course i do know that uh, this workshop is primarily focused on sensors so when you want to develop a sensor what we would look for is uh, uh, the sensor should be selective okay i can give an example of uh, glucometer which is available in the market now just just give me a minute i will take some water okay. so you guys are uh, listening right uh, around 3 now yeah <laughs> or am i simply talking on my own we are listening ma'am okay you are hearing <laughs> i know my voice is slightly a lady's voice that's why i think one one of our friend said yes ma'am it doesn't matter when i when i took my mobile phone and talked to unknown person <clears throat> the first thing would come as madam only it doesn't matter 
Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, since I had classes in the morning also, my voice went even further feeble. Okay. Uh, since this workshop is mainly focused on sensor technology development, I would like to highlight, uh, uh, let's say, a glucometer which is available in the market. Okay. So how does that work? If you want to measure uh, glucose level in your blood serum sample, what you would do is you would prick your finger uh, and take a drop of blood and put the drop of blood into a, a disposable electrode, what do they provide? And connect that disposable electrode to a device and the uh, device would give you a reading. Now what's the science behind this? The disposable strip has an enzyme called glucose oxidase, which will specifically oxidize glucose to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. So that the moment you connect uh, uh, the strip into a device, the device would electrochemically either oxidize or reduce hydrogen peroxide and measure the current and correlate with the concentration of the glucose. <clears throat> you know, that's how the glucometer which is available in the market would work. Now, if you want to develop a sensor, <clears throat> the sensor should be selective and it should be stable. If it, uh, if it is re reusable, it is very good and the response time should be faster, etc. Right? Now, if you want to maximize your sensitivity, let's say you want to even measure a very low trace amount of heavy metal uh, present in a water and stuff like that, then you need to basically manipulate your material. When I say you need to manipulate, you need to look at the atomic level arrangement. You need to alter the energy level of your material. All these things are possible only through uh, such kind of technique like STM. You can move atom by atom so that you can bring in whatever the property you want to extract from the material. Okay, so not just that, fundamentally also, <clears throat> fundamentally also this technique can uh, provide much valuable information like atomic arrangement. Let's say, uh, suppose you want, to, uh, you want to give a corrosion prevention coating. Okay, so you want to form a single a layer of a molecule and the sample substrate. You can analyze how this molecule orient so that fundamentally you can able to understand the corrosion phenomena and you can able to modulate the property. So if you want to look at such kind of molecular level arrangement, the only uh, technique which is available right now is this scanning probe techniques. Okay. So if you look at uh, this structure, here, uh, here I show an image. These are the STM images. This is for a bare gold at six nanometer. You wouldn't able to see a very, uh, uh, you know, striking structural features. But the moment you modify with the thiol, uh, a molecule, let's say a naphthalene thiol, you can see there is a beautiful arrangement of molecules that uh, comes like a structural features. One can, one can see the orientation, you know, uh, perfectly ordered. And even you can measure the length of the molecule. These are all naphthalene thiol is like two benzene molecule, you know, fused together. And you can imagine these are the uh, features where benzene rings are oriented due to pi electron stacking. So such kind of arrangement one can make. Uh, I mean, one can also analyze and one can predict its crystal structure. You know, probably you guys would have listened that gold is an FCC pattern, meaning a face centered cubic system. And the moment the thiolate introduced onto the gold surface, the thiolate would go and bind to the threefold holocyte. Okay, threefold holocyte. Uh, it can form a structure like uh, root 3 by 3 R30. How do I describe this structure? Let's assume that the unit cell of gold is this. And over which I have a unit cell of a thiolate. The structure root 3 by 3 meaning the unit cell of adsorbate the thiolate is root 3 times longer in one direction and 3 times longer in the other direction. And it is tilted right side with respect to the base unit cell by 30 degree. So that's the uh, understanding behind uh, this structure. <clears throat> now. Uh, like this, I can uh, keep on highlighting some of the examples of uh, STM imaging. Uh, this is one of the hard uh, substrate. Normally, uh, there was a uh, statement saying that the rough surfaces cannot be imaged using STM. But 
provided if you know the roughness of the uh, uh, substrate you can able to get uh, uh, the uh, deposited material how it orient on the electrode surface etc now the moment i talk about stm one cannot uh, uh, give a lecture without highlighting this structure this is a very famous structure which was made by ibm juris laboratory and this is called a quantum quarrels what do i mean by quantum quarrels it's like looking like a well you know on the copper substrate copper 111 substrate there are i think 48 ion atoms yeah uh, there are 48 ion atoms which are uh, arranged on top of this uh, copper 111 surface so when you uh, <clears throat> when you manipulate such atomic level arrangement and uh, since you introduce uh, iron onto copper the quantum energy levels the energy levels of copper are quantized what do i mean by quantized you would get a discrete energy level and these rings you know these rings correspond to each energy levels on the copper 111 surface you can see this is a very beautiful image one can able to understand uh, the quantized energy levels of copper by introducing an ion atom and overall it looks like a coral structure and this will look like a quantum well and that's why uh, this structure becomes very famous what's the use of uh, such structures well you can recall uh, the famous lecture given by richard fenman by manipulating such kind of uh, atomic level arrangement and quantizing the energy level you can able to store more memory you can create ic chips of such smaller size so that you can you can maximize the sensing uh, ability you can store its memory power all those things etc right so that's why manipulating atom i mean uh, you know when i say when i show this structure uh, this is a work of uh, researches uh, at least a year or two it's not like uh, you know just like drawing with the hand we are we are discussing in terms of moving atom by atom okay and you can see that how step wise uh, uh, those people went and come up with a beautiful quantum coral structures using stm <clears throat> so uh, not just that one can get images like uh, silicon 111 uh, the atomic arrangement also one can make so overall uh, you can use the probe as an extended eye so that you can visualize an atom on the other hand you can also use this probe as an extended hand like manipulating the atom so you can move atoms molecules to localize and modify the sample substrate so that you can able to fabricate many different uh, uh, fascinating nanostructures okay like for example this one okay uh, probably you guys should have heard about a lot many lectures on nanoparticle uh, so if you control the size of this nanoparticle one can able to bridge between the two conducting substrate okay and one can able to Uh, understand a single electron tunneling single electron transfer across the interface so that's the kind of bridge what i am talking about okay so uh, uh, you can also manipulate with the bio molecules maybe i will highlight the applications in the area of bio when i discuss about afm but right now stm uh, you can uh, you can use the probe as a both manipulator and as a, a, a probe to visualize atomic arrangement <clears throat> now in the series of stm we do have uh, an another spectroscopy called the scanning channeling spectroscopy what do we do is like normal uh, spectroscopy one can do a, a spectroscopic measurement by keeping uh, the probe exactly over a single nanoparticle okay so that you can measure the change in tunneling current with respect to change in density of state and this parameter one can use as a spectroscopic mode of operation what's the use of doing the scanning tunneling spectroscopy one can able to understand for a given small bias how the tunneling current varies and you can get what is called coulomb blackhead which is a staircase model for a single electron tunneling in fact uh, this discovery also fetched a nobel prize in the area of physics okay coulomb blackhead uh, 
there was a famous person called Marcus uh, who proposed the theory for electron transfer uh, with respect to distance, how this electron transfer reactions changes. Okay, so such kind of uh, uh, single electron tunneling one can able to understand using this Coulomb uh, blockade by using scanning tunneling spectroscopy technique. <clears throat> now, uh, so in this in the series of scanning probe microscopy, STM was the first one to be discovered. And since it works based on the principle of quantum tunneling of electrons, only conducting substrates could be used to image. Conducting substrates alone could be used to understand the molecular and atomic level arrangement. On the other hand, if you want to do a non-conducting substrate, then STM cannot be used. So in order to overcome that limitation, uh, uh, the same group has come up with a, another uh, microscopy which is called atomic force microscope. <clears throat> so instead of using quantum tunneling of electron between the probe and the sample substrate, one can use the atomic force exist or intermolecular force exist between the probe and the sample substrate. So to understand this, uh, you, we need to basically understand this force distance curve. Probably you would have uh, heard about this in physics. Uh, when the probe and the sample substrate is far away, okay, it would be either in an attractive regime or it would be in a repulsive regime, depends on the nature of the sample substrate. And when you bring this as closer and closer, uh, initially it goes into what is called a non-contact regime and then into uh, finally into contact regime. And in between the two, there is a regime called intermittent contact. Okay. So AFM, I will I'll explain the basic principle, then we will uh, come back to this force distance curve again. <clears throat> now, uh, as I mentioned, yes, Gerard Binnick is also involved in the discovery of AFM in 1985, along with uh, uh, Christoph Gerber. Okay, so uh, they use basically a diamond sharp tip, uh, you know, in the case of uh, AFM, they use what is called a cantilever, and at the end of the cantilever, they attach uh, a probe called a silicon nitride or silica or a diamond so that when you bring the cantilever as close as possible to the sample substrate, depends upon the intermolecular force of attraction or repulsion between the sample substrate and the probe, the cantilever start to oscillate. Okay, The cantilever start to vibrate. And the back side of the cantilever is coated with the gold so that one can shine the laser light on top of this cantilever. And by looking at the intensity of the reflected light using a photodiode, you can correlate the oscillation. You can correlate the change in spring constant of the cantilever. And that is the basic principle behind uh, atomic force microscopy. Okay. I will explain again. So this this is the uh, one I was talking about. So this is a cantilever, which is nothing but a polymer. And at the end of the cantilever, one can attach a silicon nitride, silica, or silicon diamond as a tip. And usually the backside of the cantilever is coated with gold, so that when you shine laser light on top of this cantilever, by looking at uh, the intensity change, one can able to correlate the oscillation change, the force constant exist between the sample substrate uh, uh, sample substrate and the uh, probe, which is nothing but silicon nitride in this case. <laughs> and these are the different components of an AFM. Okay? Uh, you need a laser light, you need a photo detector, you need an amplifier to maximize the force constant, and you need cantilever, probe, and the sample substrate, etc. So that's the uh, uh, atomically sharp uh, uh, cantilever you would get. This is a silicon nitrate tip. Okay, uh, this is uh, the basic principle I talked about. <clears throat> now, one can image the uh, atomic or molecular arrangement of non-conducting substrate using AFM through do, uh, through three different modes. First one is contact mode. Next, non-contact, and the third one is intermittent or capping mode. So. This is what uh, uh, I talked about earlier, this force distance curve. When you come back to this curve again, when you bring the probe as close as possible to the sample substrate, 
one can carry out uh, in the beginning a non contact mode okay there would be a, a, a defined distance of separation between the probe and the sample substrate one can image using this non contact mode or one can use a contact mode of imaging when i say contact mode literally the probe will touch the sample substrate which is not a good mode of operation okay when i say contact mode the probe would literally touch the sample substrate uh, for example um, uh, uh, if you want to image let's say a biomolecule a protein anchored on the sample substrate you know uh, normally i do talk about this human behavior uh, maybe a small story then i will come back to uh, the concept again <clears throat> let's say suppose uh, uh, you guys uh, take a good food in the night okay good dinner and go to bed to sleep right and who asked you to wake up in the morning probably disturbance from our wife or husband spouse etc kid the mobile phone alarm let's say we get up and uh, uh, you get ready maybe after an hour or two you feel hungry right so why do we feel hungry and that's the question let's assume you take good breakfast and the moment you come to a, a bus stop to catch a bus to go to college or university or institute when you look at someone you feel very happy and when you look at someone else you feel very much irritated correct all these things happen let's say within a span of 3 to 4 hours why do all these things happen you would say simply uh, that all these things happen because of uh, Uh, you know biochemical reaction which occurs in our body when you say biochemical reaction there is an electron transfer reaction and the biomolecule should undergo structural changes especially with respect to proteins okay proteins enzymes etc <clears throat> uh, the structural change of protein one can able to analyze using this afo and there are uh, that's where the contact mode becomes very very useful you can literally touch uh, the uh, biological molecule and when you can bring uh, the probe back you can understand the length of the protein and how it folds and orient on the sample substrate by looking at uh, this structural changes one can directly correlate with the function and the function could be correlated to the human behavior so such kind of uh, operation one can do with contact mode in fact afm is uh, predominantly used to understand the biological structure and function nowadays apart from these two mode we do have a tapping mode uh, which is a kind of intermittent bridging between non contact and contact mode okay so that is uh, of course uh, these are the modes i highlighted a while ago you know uh, one can measure either the repulsion or attraction between the sample uh, sample and the tip depends upon the nature of the uh, sample and the surface arrangement okay similarly this is a kind of non contact mode <clears throat> one can also uh, image at a, a slightly far away distance but still there would be a intermolecular force of uh, attraction or repulsion exist between the sample substrate and the probe so that one can use and uh, 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 since there would be a definite distance the cantilever or the probe do not touch the sample substrate so this is the most preferred this one non contact and tapping mode are the most preferred mode of operation uh, uh, in case of af okay uh, so of course uh, this mode of operation can overcome uh, the problem uh, uh, problems associated with friction adhesion uh, electrostatic forces etc and uh, this kind of tapping mode could also be used to scan over the uh, large area okay <clears throat> now uh, the limitation of afm is uh, you need to have a very sharp and high aspect ratio tip like this so that when you move this tip across the sample substrate the images you would get is a very high resolution and uh, striking structural features one can obtain using such kind of sharp tip if you use a very uh, low aspect ratio tip a blend one uh, it it would not give an atomically striking features using af okay okay so that's the uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> that's the kind of uh, overall diagram of this 
if you want to look at uh, uh, certain applications with respect to this scanning probe technique one can understand uh, the metal corrosion behavior you can pinpoint where exactly the corrosion starts okay uh, the moment uh, uh, as i mentioned earlier you can give a coating to inhibit this corrosion you can uh, uh, you can prevent the corrosion by providing a coating paint etc and this, what kind of molecular length is optimal to prevent such kind of corrosion coating one can understand uh, using this hdm technique okay uh, like uh, the one what i showed naphthalene thiol is just two benzene ring if we keep on adding like this this is called a pentacene yeah pentacene where we have uh, uh, five benzene rings and you can see such molecules uh, arrange on the sample substrate very very beautiful you can you can look at uh, the pi electron density distribution uh, using uh, such afm images okay like this uh, i can keep on showing a lot many images depends upon the molecule and this is the theory i mentioned just a while ago this is called the marcus theory he proposed a theory with respect to change in distance how the electron transfer rate constant varies okay so that theory was validated between uh, donor acceptor molecule uh, using such kind of uh, uh, scanning probe technique <clears throat> now uh, what are the advantage of using this technique well one can create even a transistor i would say even bio transistor based on protein using such nanotechnology arrangements at uh, very low separation of uh, within nanometer level separation between the probe and the sample substrate or a source and drain uh, in in uh, transistor case this biomolecule will act as a uh, medium for electron to be transferred across this okay so that you can have a 2d close pack arrangement of biomolecules and you can understand how uh, the uh, how the ion transport across the channel works you know <clears throat> uh, probably nowadays you know uh, we do know about our health conditions very precisely most of the time if you go for clinical analysis they do uh, talk about na plus k plus ratio sodium ion potassium ion ratio because those are the ions that are translated across our membrane this transport of ions induces what is called the membrane potential and by playing with this ratio one can even modulate the human behavior okay so such kind of modulation one can able to understand so uh, in a way a biomimic system could be created using this uh, uh, bio uh, chemically gated transistor okay such kind of arrangement one can able to understand uh, using scanning probe microscopy <clears throat> okay uh, i am not sure already it's about 3 20 can i wind up in 5 minutes if it is okay 5 to 7 yes sir. Minutes? yes sir sure sir yeah okay uh do the other technique i promised during my lecture was this xps uh, i know i do have uh, probably many slides but i will try to wind up maybe in a 5 to 7 minutes <clears throat> okay Uh, x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is again a very uh, useful technique if you want to understand uh, uh, if you want to understand the energy levels associated uh, uh, with the material <clears throat> now wh why okay i i talked about moving from using visible light as a source to visualize an object instead of using uh, light visible light one can use electron as a probe one can use uh, x rays as a probe that's where the x ray diffraction technique like xrd and xps comes into picture okay why xps becomes important probably you guys would know about this photoelectric effect you would have heard of uh, einstein you know uh, whenever you want to talk about xps you cannot skip einstein einstein uh, einstein was uh, how do we put it he was the you know a uh, unique scientist who who can you know no one can imagine the way einstein imagined i would put it that way in fact uh, during 1905 1905 he has provided solution to five problems at the same time 
you know he he talked about photoelectric effect he talked about theory of relativity he talked about the existence of black hole that's the area uh, nobel prize in physics was awarded yesterday okay <clears throat> so uh, like this theory of relativity reference time etc to a big bang theory for example you know the universe big bang theory all the five uh, uh, he he has given five solutions to the problem in the year 1905 in fact in 2005 physicists celebrated centenary year uh, to commemorate the discovery of einstein so he was the man behind discovery of photoelectric effect uh, when an electron beam or let's say when a radiation uh, interacts with metal there could be many processes that can happen you know the uh, a beam irradiation beam can be reflected from the metal surface it can penetrate through the metal surface it can when it interacts with the metal surface it can emit photoelectric effect it can it can exhibit photoelectric effect it can eject the electron out of it and when it is ejects the electron out of it what is the electron we detect is it as primary electron it is an electron ejected from a secondary orbital etc <clears throat> so that's where the xps comes into picture so xps precisely measures the electrons which come from the outermost orbital okay so you can able to measure what is called binding energy of the electron with respect to uh, atom so by looking at the change in binding energy one can able to understand what are the elements which are present in the sample substrate and what it's it, what are its oxidation states that's why uh, the xps comes into picture you know that that's what i was talking about okay <clears throat> so when an x ray beam uh, falls on the metal surface so based on the photoelectric effect uh, it can ionize an atom producing uh, an ejected electron which is free electron uh, with a definite kinetic energy so one can measure the kinetic energy using this formula h nu minus binding energy where h nu is a photon energy and if you rearrange this equation okay uh, you can able to get what is the binding energy okay so this binding energy so this is what i was talking about when it, the x ray a false uh, beam falls on the sample substrate it can penetrate up to a depth of about 1 micron so even it can eject electron from other orbitals not necessarily the outer shell it can also eject electrons from the inner orbital but uh, having a detector which can specifically measure which uh, kind of electron it ejected out you can able to understand uh, the elements present on the sample substrate <clears throat> okay uh, uh, one can control the depth of penetration we can use two different kinds of sources like magnesium k alpha which has an energy of about 1 to 5 3.6 electron volt similarly uh, the most of the equipment use what is what is called aluminum k alpha as a source x ray source so the aluminum k alpha radiation is of the order of 1486.6 this is the value you would use as a photon energy in the in the previous one okay so that's where uh, the source becomes very critical <clears throat> now uh, so it can eject either a free electron or it can eject electron from valence orbital valence electron or if you use a very uh, high intensity x ray beam one can eject electrons from the core level itself so all these things one can able to correlate directly by looking at uh, uh, directly by looking at the uh, output of xps now <clears throat> so you know these are all some of the fundamental concept probably i would skip depends upon the unit cell arrangement similar to xrd the xps could also uh, you know interact with the neighboring atom and eject electron so uh, such kind of uh, arrangement also one can predict using xps now this is the typical output of xps spectroscopy where uh, the electron count number of electron count is plotted against the binding energy so we go from a high binding energy to low binding energy regime and uh, the formation of peaks okay the formation of peaks at the specific location specific location of binding energy 
provides information about what are the elements and what are its corresponding oxidation state. For example, a typical 531 electron volt peak, a sharp peak would tell the presence of oxygen and the electron comes from oxygen 1s orbital. Okay? And similarly, the carbon would provide about 284.7 electron volt and this is carbon 1s. So, such kind of uh, precise information one would get. <clears throat> And if you go to higher orbitals, rather than S, yes, if you go to P, D and F orbitals, since we do have electron spin like P6 electrons, D10 electrons and F14 electrons, there would be splitting of peaks occur like this. It can, it can uh, provide information about the electron spin changes. One can get a spin orbital splitting by looking at such kind of peak formation. Okay, and also you can measure the area under the peak or ratio under the peak that could also be used to analyze the environment of such element like whether gold is in zero state, gold is in plus one state or plus three state etc. So such kind of information one can able to get from uh, HPS splitting. <clears throat> so uh, these are some of the applications one would do for example even for a given molecule uh, you can use what is called a peak fitting software, XPS peak fitting software, so that you can able to distinguish uh, the nature of carbon atoms and uh, uh, the environment through which the sulfur, nitrogen, those things are present. Uh, okay, so uh, especially in the case of sensor, when it involves a charge transfer complex formation, when it involves electron transfer across the molecule, one can also predict such kind of charge transfer using XPS spectroscopy. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so to finally uh, conclude, you know, uh, these techniques like uh, scanning probe microscopy, uh, including STM and AFM, and technique like XPS are just not only for imaging and analysis. You can also use these techniques for many different applications like manipulation of atom, uh, you know, manipulation of properties so that you can bring in those adverse the effect in the field of applications. Okay. Applications in the field of sensing, healthcare diagnostics, uh, material development, energy conversion, energy storage, corrosion prevention, etc. I can, I can keep on adding the list like this. Uh, but in order to do this, you know, in order to do this, what do we need is a multidisciplinary group effort. Okay. So I may be from a physics or chemistry background, but uh, the moment I uh, start doing research to find solution to the global issues, what I talked about in the beginning of my lecture, one has to take concepts from other areas. Okay, I may be a chemist, but to provide solution to global issues, I need to take concepts from physics. I need to take concepts from biology. Then only one can do a multidisciplinary approach in research so that uh, the viable solution one can provide uh, to the global issues what we will face in the upcoming 50 years or so. <clears throat> okay. So uh, finally, I would like to thank you all uh, for your patience listening. And uh, I would like to thank you again, especially uh, Dr. Balakrishnan sir, for providing me an opportunity to share with you guys what uh, the knowledge I have on uh, scanning probe microscopy and XPS. So once again, thank you. Thank you very much. I would be happy to answer any questions, queries you guys may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your valuable speech, sir. Yeah. Participants, if you have any queries, you are free to ask now. Uh, maybe I can come out of my presentation so that if you put yes, it sir, in, sure. Yeah, uh, if you put it in a chat box, uh, I can also you know, look at the chat box and answer. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, a lot of people have put only thank you and some appreciative messages, yes. Uh, okay, so I hope there are not much queries in your session. <laughs> uh, I understand. Your session was very detailed. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, sir, from the organizer side, uh, I would like to ask you one thing, sir. Can yeah. you please list out the equipments that we use for testing for various researchers? I mean, uh, as well as sensors and uh, in the fields like uh, you know the upcoming fields like bio, medical, and uh, what is available in Sikri in your institute? What and all are available? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I'm I'm happy that uh, uh, you could ask a good question finally. In fact, in the beginning of the slide, I forgot to mention about analytical facility of Sikri. I talked about the history and the way we work. Uh, in fact, we do have a good analytical facility, starting from spectroscopic instrument like FKR, NMR, uh, and the imaging uh, technique like microscope, scanning electron microscope, TEM, HRTM, FESEM, STM, AFM, you know, uh, EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy. So we do have a wide range of analytical facility. And uh, apart from this, if you want to develop sensor, let's say using electrochemical technique predominantly, uh, uh, electrochemical technique like uh, CV, impedance, or uh, you know, potential measurement, etc. We do have electrochemical equipment and handheld devices like uh, palm sense, you know, which is available in the uh, market. So those things could also be uh, uh, used for sensing purposes, and all those instruments are available in Sikri. So. Uh, and suppose if you want to do a specific characterization, our website would provide information for external samples. You can directly approach a section called ICP, International Collaborative Project Section. Okay. Uh, in fact, I, I can see that one more question that whether students can involve in internship. Yes, the same section would also deal with uh, students who are uh, like, you know, master's level. We don't take undergrad level student. If they are like young tech or MS or MSc master level student, ME, they can come here and do an internship for a period of six months. Uh, or uh, of course, depends on the curriculum. Six months to one year, they can spend the time here and they can do a project also. <clears throat> so uh, again, those details are also available in our website, uh, which is secret.res.in, cecra.res.in. There are forms they can download and fill up uh, and uh, uh, depends upon the marks. Uh, normally 90% of the student would get, uh, if they have arrears, then they won't choose for the, you know, they won't be selected for the internship. But other than that, uh, uh, I can tell you like whomever applies, 90, 95% of the uh, cases, we would take them for uh, internship. Yeah. <clears throat> so. I hope I could answer the question, I guess. Yeah. Yes, sir. thank you very much. Because uh, most of, uh, almost all our faculty members and research scholars in this FDP, and uh, I think they would have been very much benefited through your uh, answers and through your presentation also as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, so sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, in spite of your busy, busy schedule. You have spent your valuable time for us with your sure. presentation. Uh, and I would like also to like to tell that uh, this was one of the best presentations among oh, the yeah. FTP all the for the five day FTP we are about to connect. Thank you, also, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Hope to collaborate with you in future also. Sure. Thank you very much for the session. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I have my email ready. Maybe I will try to share my slide with uh, uh, Balakrishnan sir. I remember he asked. I can share the slide. Uh, in the first slide, I have my email. If you guys want to ask me anything related to research, you can send me an email. Normally, within a day or two, I reply. Uh, if at all, I'm very busy with you know lectures and this, it may take uh, at least one or two days. But I can tell you definitely you would get a reply. That I can guarantee. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much for providing an opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. See thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. So I can I can leave the meeting now, right? Please. Thank, Thank you, sir. Yeah, sure. I will leave. Thank you. Bye. Participants, you can also leave the session for now. Tomorrow morning session will start at 9.30 a.m. Thank you, everybody. All are kindly requested to fill the feedback form, which has been sent to the link as well as the WhatsApp group. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.